move on now with Sridevi Sarma from Hopkins looking at closed loop peripheral nerve stimulation for chronic pain. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gert, uh, Todd, for inviting me to this workshop. Um, so I'm Sri Sarma, I'm from Hopkins, and this work is um, fairly new to my lab. So I'm an electrical engineer, control theorist by training, um, but studied neuroscience for over a decade as well. So our lab does a lot of neuroengineering, um, but really our expertise are in Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. We've studied those uh, disorders for over 10 years. But chronic pain came up uh, to my attention maybe two years ago uh, through some of my collaborators who were interested in our lab participating in trying to build models to understand what the electrical patterns are, you know, what's happening in the pain system. So I'm saying this because we're certainly not experts, um, but what I'm here to do is to show you some of the initial ideas that we have in chronic pain, and if, you know, hopefully I can answer any of your questions. So this is primarily the work of my postdoc, Christine Pogine, and Dr. Yun Guan is an electrophysiologist, pain expert at Hopkins. Okay. So pain, chronic pain. So about 1.5 billion people in the world suffer from chronic pain. It's probably the most debilitating disease in the entire world. Um, what is chronic pain? So the definition of chronic pain is that after you have an injury and you heal, for example, um, you still have pain 12 weeks post-recovery, okay? Um, it can happen through injury, it can happen through disease, infections, and so forth. And the primary treatments still today are drugs, okay? And um, there are a lot of issues with drugs. Um, of course, with any kind of drug, you're gonna have side effects. Um, but typically with pain, you can use opioids and people can get addicted to that. So you have addiction problems, sedation tolerance, you certainly don't have any target targeted um, therapies, so you can have off-target effects and so forth. So it's a real problem. A promising alternative therapy are electrical suticals, electroceuticals, right? So this is electrical stimulation of somewhere in the nervous system to try to regulate pain, okay? So for example, so at the end of the day, um, I'll talk about the pain system in the next slide. But at the end of the day, when we perceive pain, it's through electrical patterns that are going through our nervous system, right? So the idea of electroceuticals is to try to abruptly alter the electrical patterns, okay? So you can do it in the spinal cord, okay? So you can start stimulating in the spinal cord to try to stop the pain signals going up to the brain. You can do peripheral nerve stimulation. You can attack it, try to attack it in the brain. But as all electrical stimulation therapies out there, doesn't matter what disease it is, we're always faced with the challenge of where do you put that electrode? What's the optimal target? How do you stimulate to achieve your objective, right? And when do you stimulate? Um, and so because we still don't really understand the mechanisms of actions of any of these therapies for pain, um, we really don't know how to optimize them, tune them to, to people. In fact, you know, the neurosurgeon at Hopkins for spinal cord stimulation, you know, he tells me he takes out more implants than he puts in. So the efficacy is about 50%. We really don't even know, you know, the 50% who are feeling some type of therapeutic effect. Is it because they're distracted? Is it because it just doesn't remind? Or is the pain actually gone, okay? So there's lots of limitations to this right now. But the whole, the idea is, you know, the advantage of electroceuticals over drugs is that it is reversible. You can take out that implant anytime you want. You can turn off the stimulator anytime. It's relatively minimally invasive, including in the brain, low risk, and potentially you can prove other functions. So it's worth investigating, right? Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the pain system. Ironically, I had a big fall yesterday and <laughs> scraped my knee, so it's kind of ironic that I'm talking about this today. But um, so, all right, but I don't have chronic pain, I hope. All right, so here's what happens. Say you get a splinter in your toe, okay? So your body's first response to that splinter is that there's a nerve fiber in the toe that's part of a pain receptor, so it's called a nociceptor, that sends an electrical impulse, an action potential, up the nerve fiber to a cluster of cells in the spinal cord. This is the, called the dorsal horn, 
okay? And in the dorsal horn, there's numerous neurons, a circuitry of neurons in there that are processing that information and then ultimately sending it up to the brain. Okay, it goes through the brainstem, hits your thalamus. The thalamus is then going to relay that information to various brain regions, the somatosensory cortex. This is when you actually feel it, okay? Frontal cortex, not shown here, which is when you think about it, if you have the time. And then the limbic system, which allows you to emotionally react to it. That's when you say, ouch, okay? And then, as a response, there are descending, it's not shown in this figure, but there are descending fibers that try to then regulate that pain. Okay, so it seems like a fairly simple closed loop system. We kind of know where the signals are going. We know where they're being processed. But what's really strange is you can fracture your, your wrist, you know, recover over weeks, get CT scans that show that it's completely mended, healed, and yet that person can still feel pain six months to a year later. So this is not as simple as we think it is. Clearly, there are a lot of complicated dynamics, a complicated crosstalk between spinal cord and brain that is regulating what's going on. So it's perplexing, right? And I think most of the researchers that have worked in chronic pain have decided to focus on the first central processing station, which is the dorsal horn in the spinal cord. Okay, and all the theories and models that are mathematical models that are out there to try to understand pain mechanisms um, really focus on the dorsal horn. We really haven't gotten to the brain yet, even though they're already developing theories, therapies for the brain. So let's zoom in a little bit on the dorsal horn and look at a little bit more closely to the anatomy. Certainly no details here, but here's a sort of a cross section of the dorsal horn. So it receives certain inputs, okay, from different fibers, and it's gonna send an output which goes up through the spinal cord to the brain. Okay, so what are these inputs? So these are different fibers. You have sort of the alpha A fibers and C fibers. And so like I think John's talk yesterday, these fibers are different. They're different in their thickness, okay? And so the A fibers are thicker, okay, than the C fiber. So that means they're gonna conduct faster. Signals are gonna be conducted along these fibers faster, okay? And their activation threshold is also lower. Okay, so these guys respond much more quickly and more often than the C fiber. The a alpha beta fiber tends to carry non-noxious or non-painful stimuli to the spinal cord, okay? Just simple touch that doesn't hurt. But the noxious stimuli, like through heat, for example, or even mechanical, come through the other fibers, okay? So C fiber transmits heat, okay? But all of those inputs go into this cluster of cells in the dorsal horn, and they're essentially two layers a superficial layer, okay, that's kind of at the yellow here, where many interneurons live, okay, they receive inputs from all the fibers, and then you have deep layer underneath that, which consists of more sparse neurons that we have different names for them. We have convergent neurons um, that are in the deep layer. You call them convergent, why? Because they receive inputs from all of these fibers as well as the superficial layers. You can call them WDR neurons, that's the W, wide dynamic range, because they have high bandwidth, they respond to many different stimuli. Or you can call them projection neurons. I'm just, these three different names for these deep layer neurons, because they project the final command up to the brain, okay? So there's a lot of interplay between the superficial layers and the deep layers, both layers receiving inputs from these fibers. So, People have done a lot of experiments in, in rats in particular, uh, as an example, where they'll st artificially stimulate the fibers, okay, either through some type of mechanical stimulus onto the paw of, say, mouse or rat. You can actually apply pressure, you can apply heat, or you can actually electrically stimulate the sciatic nerve. Okay, so you're trying to test the system out in an animal model, okay? And you can do this in healthy, and if you apply a particular stimulus where you might pinch the paw, then this is what the response of this projection neuron, the WDR neuron, looks like in a healthy case. Okay, it's actually responding to this somewhat painful stimulus. It sends that command to the brain, but then it stops. So you have this sort of acute response, okay? But if you take a nerve-injured rat and apply the same stimulus, okay, you see something a little different. We call this hypersensitivity. So to the same type of pinch, you get that ac acute response, just like in the healthy case, but then it keeps going on, right? So the spinal cord is still sending signals up to the brain, 
that are telling you you should feel pain. Okay, this is sort of the chronic pain condition. So this is the abnormality. So with that said, people have been experimenting with this for decades, and there was an old theory, in fact, all the therapies out there, stimulation therapies that focus on spinal cord, are based on a very old theory called the gate control theory. It was proposed by Melzack and Wall in 1965, which says, okay, this is how I think that dorsal horn works. Okay, so I've got this architecture of superficial layers of neurons, deep layers of neurons. These are the inputs, these are the outputs. Here's what I think is happening. I think that the yellow, the superficial layer, acts as a gate. Okay? If the gate is closed, no pain signals are going to go up to the brain. If the gate is open, pain signals don't go to the, or go to the brain, right? So how, and, and what closes the gate? The inhibitory neurons in this superficial layer. So for example, if I stimulate the C fiber and with a painful stimulus, okay, and I want to inhibit that pain, so I want to close that gate, then the alpha fibers will also activate and the activation on the alpha fibers will excite these inhibitory neurons, okay, in the superficial layers, and they will inhibit the projection neuron in the deep layer, and that guy won't send signals up to the brain. It was kind of a very intuitive theory based on this architecture. And then if you don't have the alpha beta fibers exciting the inhibitory neurons, gate is open, you send pain signals. So the idea here is, so the people thinking of electroceutical therapies, said, okay, if I believe in that, I'm going to do something like this in closed loop. So let me skip to this part, okay? So here are some treatments. I think this is still sort of in the research community. Maybe one of them has been FDA approved. But think about this. Okay, I just showed you a picture of hypersensitivity, right? With a little pinch, this WDR neuron continues to fire beyond the acute response. So what should a closed loop system try to do? Suppose you could measure activity in the WDR neuron, then what you could do is say, okay, I expect some acute responses, but if it keeps going on and keeps firing beyond some threshold, then I'm gonna stop it artificially. I'm gonna stimulate either the spinal cord or the brain, okay, to try to stop that excessive activity, right? So what, what could be problematic about that approach? What do you think? This is not a healthy case, right? If I, sure, I can try to find a way to stimulate at your spinal cord level to just block everything, block everything, right? But that's gonna also block all your acute, the acute pain system, which is what we need for survival, right? A healthy pain system has to respond acutely and not continuously respond, not be hypersensitive, not make you feel perceived pain when you really shouldn't be feeling that, especially if it's not detrimental for your survival, okay? So the approaches really don't work very well because this is what they're trying to do, okay? Would be a fine first step at trying it. So instead, what we thought is, okay, how can I make the nerve injured system look like a healthy system using stimulation, right? So I've got this, some complex process, it's dynamical, it has some inputs coming from these fibers, I can peripheral nerve inputs, and I'm looking at the responses of these neurons that are projecting to the brain, it's a black box, maybe I don't know what the dynamics are, but I wanna make it look like this black box, which is healthy, right? So what can I do? To make this system, I don't like its properties to look like this system. So as controls people, I don't know, John, do you remember? What would you do? I want this injured black box to look like the healthy black box using feedback control. He's quiet, he's sleeping. No idea. <laughs> Model matching. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> he's, he's kidding you. He's like the father of control. Okay, so here's the idea, okay? So I have, a, so here's sort of the notation here. H, chronic pain is CP. H describes the dynamics. It's an input-output transfer function, if you will, right? For any input, it's, it shows you how the mapping from input to an output, okay? So if I'm brushing the paw of so, an animal that has chronic pain, I assume some type of abnormal response, Y of T, that's chronic pain. 
But this, at the same time, I have this particular system, this transfer function in a naive rat and is healthy, that I like. So the idea here in model matching is I want to close the loop. Okay, so I'm going to measure this activity. So YCP is the WDR firing rates, the firing rates of those projection neurons going up. Okay, I'm going to measure that activity, process that through another controller, dynamical system, to generate a stimulation signal that I'm going to apply to the peripheral nerve so that in closed loop, this new transfer function in closed loop looks a lot like this guy. Okay, so this is called model matching. I want the error between this chronic pain signal in closed loop to look like this naive. Okay? All right. So how do we do it? There's many ways to do it. We just, again, this is our first crack at stuff. Is okay, so how do I do this? Well, first of all, I need to know what HCP, I need to know what HN is. So I need to have models of a chronic pain dorsal hone as well as the naive. And if I have those two models, then I can do something like minimizing this error, the transfer, the max gain of this error signal, gain in the frequency domain. So we do what's called H infinity uh, model matching. So we're trying to find this controller K, okay, that stabilizes the closed loop system, so you want to make sure it's stable, that minimizes the maximum gain of this error transfer function. So it's like you're squashing the worst case, the worst max gain. Okay, so the H infinity gain, if you have a scalar system and you're looking at a transfer function for an LTI system, you're looking at the Fourier transfer, this is like the magnitude response as a function of frequency, you're looking to minimize the max gain. Okay, but what we're doing is we're minimizing the max gain of the error transfer function. Okay, so how do we get these models? So this is where Dr. Yun Guan comes in and he gives us some data that he's collected for our uh, purposes. So this experimental data set has five healthy rats, two rats that had, he did a sciatic nerve injury to, so they're the chronic pain model, and he's recording, putting microwires into superficial layer to record local field potentials in the of these interneurons, and then he's getting spiking activity of the WDR neurons, okay, in both of these cases. He applies various inputs, different types of inputs, and he records the responses. So today, what we're going to show you is how we do the whole closed loop design, but we're only estimating our models based on these, this particular input. Well, now we're using everything, but for now, we're just using the paired pulse inputs that excited the system to do the system identification. Okay. So here's some of the data. I just want to show you what it looks like to go from injured, uh, healthy to injured. So this is the local field response. So his measurements from the superficial layers, he's looking at local field potential activity. So these two pulses just represent where the inputs were applied to the, sci to the sciatic nerve, okay? And here are the responses of the superficial layer. So the blue is healthy and red is nerve injured or chronic pain. So that's superficial layer, if you look at the firing rates of the WD and R neurons to the same pulses, you see something kind of interesting. So blue is healthy. Okay, why do you see, so first of all, if you look at this, the pulses were here. So the, this is the response to the first pulse. This is the full response to the second pulse, okay? So why do you see two bumps? Because remember, you have an A fibers and C fibers. One conducts faster than the other. So you're going to see the response to the A fiber here in the first peak. The second peak is due to the response of the C fiber. Okay? Now what's happening in the chronic pain condition is you have the C component, which is the second peak, tends to respond more and earlier. So why? Why would this happen in a chronic pain condition? It's complicated, right? There could be lots of things happening in terms of the cytoarchitecture of the dorsal horn. Neurons can be changing their fiber conductivity patterns. Interneurons could be dying. Maybe the inhibitory neurons are, there's some cell death, and there's less inhibition overall in the entire system. Who knows? But there seems to be this overall effect at the output, okay? So that output, by the way, this WDR firing is our Y of T. So we're going to call this U of T input Y of T because I want a mapping from U to Y. Remember those transfer functions? I need to find a mapping from U to Y. I want to estimate that from the data. Okay, so here's my input U, output Y, and here's sort of the interconnection, the architecture of our model H. So we're gonna get a transfer function for healthy, 
using the naive rat, rat data, and we're going to get a transfer function for the chronic pain condition using the nerve injured rats data, okay? And each of these is just how we built the architecture for that mapping in each case, okay? So there's a delay due to the alpha beta fibers, and all of these we started off with just simple linear time invariant, therefore transfer functions. Okay, we use some system identification techniques, and here are some of the results. Okay, oh, I'm gonna skip this. I'm assuming with this engineering audience, we know about transfer functions and so forth. We did not assume, we allowed zeros to, to be in place, but this was just for a slightly different audience. Okay, so here are some examples. So <clears throat> we have model overlaid with data. Okay, remember, this is just the open loop system H in the naive case versus the injured case. Okay, so here's the local field potential. So here's the response in the LFP, and what our model does is a pretty good reconstruction over the data. Okay, and this is what the model is predicting in the WDR, or sorry, this is in the healthy and this is in the injured case. Okay, so the model for both healthy injured seems fine in terms of capturing superficial layer activity. What about the WDR firing rate? Same thing. The model is the dark line, and it's pretty much right overlaid with the data, okay? So we think we have pretty good model fits. So now that I have the model fit, I can apply that model matching scheme, right, and see how well I do in simulation, okay? So I'm applying the controller in simulation using my models, okay? So this is what, as you recall, I'm just showing the data again. This is what the firing rate of the WDR neuron, what projects up to the brain, okay, looks like in health. That's what I want to achieve. This is what it looks like when you're nerve injured, right? I already showed these data before. Now if I close the loop and apply my controller to my chronic pain model, I pretty much recover the healthy state, okay? So that's nice, okay. But what kind of input is required? So what is that U of T, that, that sort of the, the actual stimulation signal that I need to put into the peripheral nerve? I put no constraints on that in this example here, right? I put no energy constraints. I did put no safety constraints, right? So we have to think about that. But this is what comes straight out of the optimization. So this is my U of T. This would be what I would need to stimulate the peripheral sciatic nerve with to accomplish this firing rate from WDR, which looks like that healthy, okay? So we know, at least from the hardware, these closed-loop devices, they don't typically generate these nice continuous signals. What do they do? They apply pulses, right? Trains of pulses, you can change the amplitude, you can change the width. Of course, they have to be biphasic and so forth, but in principle, they're pulses. So what Christine did is she says, okay, what if I start digitizing this? What if I start approximating this continuous signal with pulses, sequence of pulses. Well, this would be the case if I could just take five millisecond pulses, try to approximate that continuous signal. I'm still fine. I still can recover a healthy profile, right? If I keep going to 10 millisecond approximation, so getting coarser and coarser in that implementation of that continuous signal U, I'm still fine, right? But then when I start making it worse, like a coarser approximation, I start losing the ability to match the healthy case, okay? But it's still pretty exciting, right, that we can actually try to do this restoration. Our next steps are we're actually working with a company who's gonna give us the closed loop hardware to actually test out some of these ideas. So we have the RAP models. We, so here's how it would go. We, we took the data, we build these models, we took the models, designed the controller K, okay? And then what I showed you is, what does K look like when it's applied to the model, right? But now what we're gonna do is I have that controller K that's gonna sit here in the computer. And now as I'm measuring the WDR from activity from the rat, that activity is gonna go through the computer, the computer is gonna decide what that stimulation signal needs to be in real time and apply it right back to the sciatic nerve. So now K is applied to the real system, right? Which could be completely different results, we'll see. Okay, what happens? But that's our next steps. Um, 
that's it. I, I just wanted to thank, so Christine is the postdoc. She's a mechanical engineer, graduated from Virginia Tech, now in my lab. Dr. Yun Guan is actually a, a leader in the pain field, so we're lucky to have him at Hopkins. He runs all the experiments. So one of the things I probably didn't do justice for him is apparently, so I just said he stuck these wires, he recorded activity from WDR, he recorded activity from the superficial layers, we're all good, and he gives the data. So apparently, if you stick needles in superficial layers, you have no idea what neurons you're catching. You don't know what's excitatory, what's inhibitory. You don't know what's going on. You have to genetically change the mice, right, and then apply all kinds of t imaging techniques to actually see where you're going and what you're doing. So actually, the getting the data is not as trivial. So he's the, sort of the expert in that. And this work is supported by the NIH as well as the Hopkins Blaustein Pain Treatment Center. So thank you. Thanks very much. It's not clear to me why the information that the dorsal hone is getting from the nociceptors looks different. It's sooner, it's more robust. How does that happen? So you mean in the healthy situation? Yeah. No, no, I oh, mean in chronic. the injured situation, right. there's a significant change right. in firing. Right. Its onset is earlier and its volume is greater in the injured nociceptor. You mean the actual nociceptor? Yeah. The, the, well, I mean the, the injured nerve. In the injured nerve. So the, de the signal that should be delayed is not as delayed in the injury situation as it is in the... So it depends. It depends on... So the, the example I gave you or the one... I mean, every injury is different. Yeah. There's so many reasons why things can go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So as you say, it could be some properties on, on the nociceptor level, yeah. which transmits earlier or has mm -hmm. changed the threshold. So now the threshold is smaller and you feel pain more often, a simple touch will cause you pain. So that can happen at the nociceptor level. I'm not sure what type, I mean, it could happen through various types of injury, but then that could be perfectly normal. And then what can go wrong at that point? Mm -hmm. Well, it could be cell death in the superficial layer, right? Sure. Or extra arborization of the excitatory neurons in mm -hmm. the superficial layer, right? Mm -hmm. That things can go wrong there. That could also, there could be imbalance of neurotransmitters in any one of those layers. I mean, it can right. go on and on and on. So I don't have an answer to why for that yeah. particular case it would happen. But at the end of the day, what I feel is kind of nice in terms of the approach, the engineering approach here is I don't care. I don't care about the mechanisms. I don't care, I'm not saying that's a good thing, I'm just saying a possible mm -hmm. therapeutic solution at this yeah. point yeah. is I don't know why it's going wrong, whether mm -hmm. it's at the, the input stage, the layers or anything, but I just know that from an input-output perspective, right. I want to restore yeah. regardless yeah. of what's going gotcha. on. Gotcha, gotcha. Questions? Todd. Uh, we, we know that for control, time scales and delays and things like that always matter. And so your, your, the input for your controller is firing rate. Yeah. One of the things I was just curious about is yeah. there's a certain amount of time that you need to estimate the firing rate. Yeah. Have you guys taken into consideration like that delay or whatever and could that affect the stability? Or I'm just curious about that. Yeah. The firing rate is the input. Right. So, yeah. It takes time to measure to, that to quantity. Measure, right. So the way, so really what you measure from the wire is, is sort of, it's actually multi-unit, but you threshold it to get spikes, right? And so what, what Todd is saying is bringing up a good point is I have these spikes coming out of my measurements, so what do I do? I can take some sliding window and average the, the rate of spikes, right? The number of spikes in that time window. Now, to get the first value of firing rate, maybe I'm gonna do that over 10 milliseconds. So I have to wait 10 milliseconds for my first measurement. That's a delay, right? And so it's control, like when you have delays in the feedback, that could cause problems, both in stability and performance, right? We haven't looked at that, but we also haven't, I mean, this is just the, literally the first, that's why I was a little hesitant, you sure you want me to talk about economy? Um, the, the second one beyond the delays is uh, model uncertainty, so robustness across, but you know, do we want to do this for every individual rat? Do we want to try to have some generic solution using okay, we have a family of possible models and I want to make sure it works for everybody in the family, do some type of robust. We haven't done any of that, but that's where we're going. I mean, there's a lot more to do, but you're right. We have to worry about that. Yeah. Dr. Sarma, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, so what we're talking about here is nociception, not necessarily pain, am I right? Because pain is more of, means the cortex needs to get up to, it's more of right. an appraisal, correct? Right. So, um, I'm curious, when, when these nociceptors or these signals um, start to look more healthy, 
Does that correlate with behavior? I don't know, right? So, so it, it's hard to say. I think one could argue that there's evidence that it could. Just think of spinal cord stimulation. It, when you put a, it's subdural implant, right? And it's gonna be doing something, right? It's applying these pulses into this fiber where all kinds of signals are coming up. And since it's electrical stimulation, it does has an antidromic response, right? So you're also directly impacting dorsal horn as well as what gets transmitted to the brain. Nobody really, how it's, you know, people are studying what, what it's doing. But there are people who say, I feel better. And it's not clear if it's placebo or if it's a distraction because they feel some type of like a buzzing sensation as opposed to pain. But I, I think, it, put it this way, I would say that if you told somebody, I'm putting this in there and it's going to make all the signals look normal by the time they get to your brain, if it works, you, we will not be able to know if it's a placebo effect or not, mm. right? I mean, maybe you could do some control. The, which one, the placebo, placebo effect. Placebo. Right, right, so I guess I don't, Right, I don't know the answer, but I think these are the kinds, if you actually, if this actually works in vivo, then those are the kinds of the next level set of questions to try to understand is really is it changing perception, is it what's, and then going to the brain, which we don't even touch right now, right? Yeah. Any further questions? Go ahead. Um, I, I guess you already under, uh, like, try to explain it, but I just want to make sure that were you considering the effect of peripheral stimulation, the afferent pathway, or, I mean, I mean, the consistent of that pain, would, would you consider comparing what have caused that either peripherally or from a central contribution? You, you mean? The corticospinal contribution, because when you stimulate, when the dorsal root ganglion is still intact, you're going to get like back and forth besides the, right. the so feedback when, that you're providing. Right, so there's- Thank you. Bit, right, right, so again, we only can figure this out when we implement it, but so I don't know if, I think what you're getting is when you artificially stimulate a neuron or a nerve, right? So usually neurons, when you, when you have natural stimuli from the environment, you generate an action potential and there is a direction associated with that. It goes in one direction down the axon. But when you stimulate artificially, you put a wire in and you put dump charge to generate the act, it can go both ways, yeah. okay? And so this is what's complicated. So we are obviously assuming a direction when we do the design, but we have no idea, right? Because when you stimulate, it's gonna also go in the other direction, how that's gonna affect when real tactile, how that affects the nociception, right? So very good point, we don't know. But at least what I can say is, for the therapies that have been tried, and I think they're great efforts, it's, it's very still simple, simplistic in its, in its sort of thinking, like infancy. i just going to see if I can block, and that's a great first step. But that could be very dangerous, right, in the long term. And, it's, and of course, that threshold, they're going to be very sensitive. They don't want to block everything, right, because they know you need to feel heat or if you get stabbed or something, right? So the threshold is probably a weak type control, and therefore you still feel pain, right? So, Thank you very much for your talk. Time for a break.